All right. So, all right, people. Today we have a granddaddy of kettlebell training, bodyweight training, mobility, and uh, anything fitness related. Uh, if you're in a fitness industry and you haven't heard of Steve Cutter, you have to get out, man. You have to get out. <laughs> I don't know where you've been living, but Steve Cutter is definitely the guy to talk to. So today we are going to see what's happening with him. He was a little bit off the radar last couple of years, but now he's slowly coming back, conquering new new markets. And so we are going to talk about a lot of things training and not training related with Steve. All right. How are you, Steve? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. That's a nice introduction. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm doing glad, well. Glad. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Nice to nice to talk to all of you. Yeah, I'm so glad you, you managed to have some free time because I know you're super busy, so this is a, an honor and a privilege. <laughs> for me as well. Thank you yes. very much. All right. I'm gonna start Usually they always start uh, with the question like, you know, tell us a little about yourself, your background, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to ask you, who is Steve Cutter? Um, I'm a lot more than my name. I'm a lot more than my body. Uh, I'm a spiritual being in a human body. I'll say that. Um, what I do is I, I function through the physical, you know, I, I'm relate in, in terms of my profession I'm in the uh, physical culture, so I work with people on their, you can say initially their body, but it's really about the mind. Um, exercise is the vehicle that I use to share my message with the world, which is about health. It's about health and vitality and, and personal power. Um, I have a family. I have three wonderful children, um, beautiful wife. Uh, six cats, three dogs. Uh, so, you know, I, I travel around the world. I've, I've, you know, taught in 60 countries in the past uh, eight years. Um, spend most of my working hours in Asia nowadays since the last year and a half. I go to China about every six to eight weeks. Um, you know, so fitness is really growing in terms of the interest there. And, um, you know, other than that, I just I, I stay at home in San Diego, live that Southern California kind of beach bum lifestyle. Except I don't surf and I don't <laughs> stay on the beach, but you know, just just a laid back, you know, easy going guy that that loves life. Amazing. And that that's a little bit about me. That's great. I mean, with all this. Uh... Cats and dogs and kids, uh, you're not bored. <laughs> no, no, no. I, if yeah. I'm bored, that's a personal problem for sure. <laughs> no, it's amazing, really, really. The way to live. Uh, okay, uh, we have to, of course, talk about kettlebells. So uh, tell me, what are the pros and cons of kettlebell training? And in your opinion, is it the best training tool out there overall? Um, I can't say, uh, I'll answer the second question first. I can't say it's the best because um, the tool is only as useful as the hand that holds it. So we have to step, take a step back and we have to look at the body. And, you know, from there we go deeper and we look at the mind and we look at the breath. So it's the mind and the breath and the body. From there, if I have a kettlebell in my hand or a barbell or a club, it's just you're an artist sculpting. So kettlebell is a fantastic tool. I can never say it's the best. Uh, it's the best for certain things. So we'll talk about that. Uh, the, the pros, it's, it's going to be power endurance. Um, you know, in, in a phrase, we would say kettlebells specializes in power endurance, uh, work per unit of time. It's a fixed weight. And so because it's a fixed weight, uh, we progress through volume rather than load. Uh, you know, obviously we do want to progress in load, but it's not power lifting. We're, we're not looking to find the heaviest kettlebell that we can lift for one rep. Rather, once I can do it once, now I try to do it twice, and then I try to do it five times and ten times and a hundred times. So it's it's on the endurance side of the scale, not on the strength side of the scale. And then the power has to do with the speed, so the, the repetition per minute. 
Um, obviously, the design is another pro because we can manipulate the position to make it either easier or harder. So we can actually manipulate the leverage of the implement, which is something that you don't normally find with a dumbbell. With a dumbbell, uh, you know, a, a 20 kilo dumbbell is a 20 kilo dumbbell, and it's not really going to be any different. With kettlebell, of course, the weight is fixed, but if I hold it upside down versus by the handle, or if I hold it, you know, open palm, it's going to feel like three completely different weights. So the design is another advantage. Um, dynamic grip endurance, that's another advantage because you because you have a thick handle and you're swinging it ballistically. You know, so those are probably the highlights: the, the power endurance, the grip, uh, dynamic grip development and the uh, versatility of the tool in terms of the the way that we can use it. Excellent. Uh, for fat loss, very, very good tool. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at, again, uh, calories per minute or calories per hour, it's going to grade very, very highly uh, compared to any type of methodology out there. And there's some now there's some scientific validation to that as well in terms of uh, comparing kettlebell to say running. Um, it's, it's very comparable and everyone knows that running is one of the fastest ways to elicit weight loss. So we could say it's like running and weightlifting combined without the pounding of the joints that you would have in running. So in my my experience, it's a superior tool for fat loss than, say, uh, long, slow distance uh, because you have the cardio, you don't have the pounding. And, you know, so the pounding will eliminate people with joint conditions, uh, especially very heavy people. Maybe they start running, they're going to have ankle, knee, hip, lower back discomfort. That's not good. It's not sustainable. Kettlebells, you're not going to have that because you're on the ground. And um, but you're still getting the cardio benefits. And in addition, you're getting some anaerobic training. You can you can up the intensity. So it's a very nice mixture for fat loss uh, when you start looking at the volume and, and how many repetitions you can do in a short period of time. It just adds up. Um, and, and there's many, many success stories of people losing, you know, 60 pounds, 100 pounds. Excuse my American arrogance. The rest of the world uses the metric system. So, oh, that's okay. uh, you know, uh, 30 kilo, 50 kilo or more of, of yeah. body weight, you exactly. know, fat loss. So it's, it's pretty remarkable for that. Yeah, basically, you, know, you, you take 10 minutes and just do swings in 10 minutes. I mean, it's an amazing workout by itself, you know. Yes. But uh, there, then, then we have the, the question of technique. It has to be the perfect technique, right? Exactly. So that's the specialization. And just that in and of itself is going to reduce the amount of people that are – because to specialize in anything takes a devotion of time. And if you're going to work a lot in that area, by you know definition, you're not going to be working in other areas. So um, there's divisions with kettlebell. You have your sportsman where the kettlebell is the sport. And so then it becomes how many reps, how many snatches, how many jerks can you do, how many clean and jerks. And then you have kettlebell as, say, one tool in a toolbox, and you may have other tools. The technique's not going to be as specialized, but it can still be very effective. And so it really depends on where the person wants to come into it. Um, if they're a personal trainer, it's one tool they may use. They need to have a professional competency, not making any major mistakes uh, they don't necessarily have to have the high degree of specialization where they can do 10 minutes without stopping. Um, you know, if it's a recreational user, then we're going to keep it much more streamlined. We're not going to get into a lot of complexity. Uh, we may not be doing things like snatch or clean where there's a there's a specific uh, technique. You know, but they can certainly do swings and goblet squats and presses very easily with with very minimal technical knowledge. So again, it's it's still going to be versatile for for any user. So, what are your thoughts uh, about, uh, for example, weekend certifications? Can it be learned in one weekend? Well, I'll speak about my weekend certification. Um, you cannot you cannot master in one weekend. 
you can certainly learn the fundamentals. Uh, you can you can certainly understand what the major mistakes are to to avoid. Uh, you can learn the necessary support exercises to to improve the main techniques, and you know from that you can go and you can practice. And then over six months time, over a year's time, now you can develop a degree of mastery. Um, you know, say so for my course. The large majority of students that come to my course, they're already going to have been practicing for for at least several months, if not longer, before they even come to my certification. And so I have a, you know, because as you as you suggest, a weekend format is not the ideal situation to develop any skill, but it's the nature of of what we can do uh, with the limitations that we have, and so. Uh, in my course, we, I have a very strict testing procedure. Uh, anyone can take my certification, but for you to actually be recognized and to be certified through IKFF, you have to pass a strict uh, technical exam. And so that's where you show your skills. And uh, somebody could not just show up in a weekend and expect to pass that. They're going to have to do their homework. So, uh, but... If you're a user, if you're a businessman and you just want to lose a little bit of weight, absolutely in a weekend you can learn everything you need to know. And it's just a matter of you're going to take it and you got to practice it. If you don't practice it, exactly. you know, you're going to lose it. Yeah. It's not going to stay. So it's just like anything. Yeah. So how would you compare uh, IKFF uh, and the uh, Russian, for example, uh, system? Well, I don't compare. Um, the Russians are the best in the world at what they do, and I'm the best in the world at what I do. And um, the common factor is the kettlebell. So I have tremendous respect for uh, any great technician, any great athlete, but I actually have more respect for, for the great athletes and the great coaches that also have great character. That's far more important to me. I don't really care what kind of sportsman someone is. I yeah. care about uh, can they teach it and can they show the true value of the sport, which is how do you treat other people? How do you uh, conduct yourself in a civilization? Uh, because to me, that's that's really the test of how well you know your craft is can you apply it outside of you know the platform? Um, but in terms of the kettlebell, you know, uh, I'm a student as well as a teacher, so I've also been informed by the Russian methods. Um, I've studied with many of the best uh, Russian coaches and most successful Russian coaches and have learned their methods and have studied their methods and practiced their methods. And, and whatever methods that I learn, if I find that there's a better way, if, if I find that there's a more efficient way, then I will – study it and I will integrate it into my own system because for me it's all about getting the message across uh, more directly and as efficiently as possible. As far as my program though, it, it's very different because the Russian system focuses on sport. So the kettlebell coaches are specialists in kettlebell sport and in, in terms of what is known, Russians have been doing it longer than anybody. Um, what I do though is I, I work with, with fitness professionals and I also work with the general public and so there's different needs um, I can take the technical knowledge and uh, you know just along the same systems of what the Russians teach the modern modern kettlebell methods and I can teach that however my goal is to take that and work with a fitness professional and communicate how they're going to take that and how they're going to bring it to the masses. So it's a totally different objective because it's not about, you know, this office worker or this housewife or this regular person. It's not about can they go from, you know, 50 reps to 100 reps to 150 reps in 10 minutes in, in two exercises. That's not what it's about. It's about can they do it safely and effectively without hurting themselves and can these fitness professionals teach these regular people that aren't super athletes, that aren't taking whatever supplementation, that aren't training like a professional athlete and devoting their life to that sport. So it's totally different. And I can learn a lot from them and they can learn a lot from me about different areas. So, you know, and so when you ask me to compare, 
I don't compare because uh, what I do is is different than what anyone else does, and it's something that I've refined over many years, um, and it's just as much communication as it is tech, technique and method. Uh, there's a lot of people that can teach someone how to grip a kettlebell and how to swing and snatch a kettlebell. So um, my aspect is more on the teacher and on the development of the individual and the mind and the body with that. So it's very, very different. <laughs> Excellent. That's good. That's the only way. <laughs> All right. Uh, the three biggest like aha moments in your career or the three biggest things you learned in your rich career. We have to start uh, when I was 12 years old. And again, I, I didn't plan this. And, you know, I don't know if your readers know it. None of these questions did I know in advance. Oh, of so course, yeah. You're asking me like what <laughs> occurs in my mind right now. If you ask me in a week, there might be a couple of different <laughs> ones. But uh, the first occasion, I was 12 years old. I had just moved to, to California the day before. Um, I came from the East Coast. I was born in New York, lived in Philadelphia, moved all the way across the big, big country to the opposite coast, right? Uh, so the day after I moved here, I went to my brother's uh, Chinese martial art classes, and it was you know only adults, and I'm this little 12 year old kid, and I looked my martial art teacher in the eye, and I became his student at that point, and so that was that was revolutionary in terms of my development and everything I've done since then, because that started me on my career path, and it take has taken different shapes, but essentially that was my formal introduction to, to physical culture, to physical training via the traditional Chinese martial arts and, and the internal martial arts, which is, includes the meditation and the Qigong, which is the breathing training, uh, you know, the Chinese medicine, which is the massage and the bone setting, as well as the martial art part, the fighting and the self-defense and the physical training and weapons and those things. So that was a first aha moment. Uh, second aha moment was probably years later when I realized I wasn't going to be teaching martial arts for the rest of my life as my profession. <laughs> and I was about, uh, 27 years old. I'd been studying, you know, religiously all day, every day for 15 years at that point. And, uh, realized, you know, this is not what I'm going to be doing, uh, as my career. And so what am I going to do next? And so that's when I went to uh, university and I studied kinesiology and got my degree a few years after that, uh, began working as a personal trainer. And so that was kind of the second. And in that period of time is when I, uh, actually came across the kettlebells. I first started seeing advertisements in, uh, 2001 in a Vitalik's catalog from Dragon Door. Pavel was brand new on the scene at that point. Actually, he didn't even have a kettlebell program. He was, he was uh, showing these stretching programs. And, and then, and then uh, 2002 is when I got my first kettlebell. I, I saw the ads for about a year and I was like, oh, interesting, looks interesting. Finally, I decided to invest. I didn't have any money, so the kettlebells were expensive for me. Uh, but uh, a friend of mine had had one. I had a chance to feel it, and then after that, I figured out a way to get a couple. So I, I taught myself at home, got involved with the kettlebell community, uh, trained myself for a year at home just using Pavel's basic video. And then 2003, I, I uh, went to the RKC community, which predates uh, Strong First and even predates the terminology of hard style uh, associated with kettlebell. And I uh, in, immediately connected with Pavel. He asked me to be an instructor in his program. And so I, I, I was working with RKC for several years as one of their uh, key senior instructors that helped develop the, the first programs, the early programs. Um, and then I'd say the third, in terms of my professional aha moment, was starting in um, two, 2007 when I uh, had just – left RKC community and I hadn't started IKFF yet, but I started doing seminars around the world. I started getting invited uh, to different countries in Europe and elsewhere and started doing seminars. And then a year later started doing certifications. And, and from there, 
the world opened to me. Um, I got to go to every every continent and and well, not not Antarctica yet, but every every continent except for Antarctica. And um, you know, as I mentioned, sixty countries around the world, different people, different cultures, and you know that that's been a huge eye opening and continues to continues to give me aha moments because I realize that the more the more things appear different, the more we're all the same, and we may be different uh, different races, different language, different skin tones, different customs, but at the at the root. We're not really different, and and we all want the same basic things, and you know that gave me a lot of hope and a lot of uh, faith in in humanity and just my purpose in the world, and uh, you know the interrelationship of things. So you can you can say those are my three aha moments up to now. <laughs> Great, amazing. Uh, what is the definition of being fit? Being fit is a component of something larger, which I call being healthy, which is a component of something larger, which I call being well. So fitness is a key component to well-being. And it has to do with the physical condition. It has to do with the, uh, if we forget that we're people and we pretend that we're cars, fitness is the condition of the car. It's a condition of the body and the engine that runs it. But it's not the entire thing. Exactly. It's a piece of a puzzle. <laughs> yes, it doesn't speak about the spirit and it doesn't speak about the mind. It only speaks about the body. Great. Uh, state of fitness in the United States and in the rest of the world. Like many, things, like many things, it's ironic <laughs> because it's it's both the leader in fitness and also uh, the leader in uh, illness. <laughs> so um, even though the food supply is completely corrupted with big pharma and, you know, and GMO and all these things and, and the average American being obese and the average American being very ignorant about quality of nutrition and quality of health, at the same time, U.S. has been and continues to set the trends for the fitness communities around the world. Uh, a good comparison, I say that if we look at sports development and sports conditioning, sports science, uh, Eastern Europe and especially Russia continues to, to be the, the primary source in that region. However, when it comes to general fitness and general population, U.S. continues to be the leader in that region. And so new programs continue to come out. Trends that start here and get big here inevitably end up eventually going all around the world. A great example is kettlebells. Kettlebells have been in Eastern Europe for many generations, uh, at least a couple hundred years. and um, But yet no one knew about it until less than 15 years ago. It, it took uh, it took an American marketing ingenuity to actually bring kettlebells. And now I've made my business since 2008 going all around the world and introducing kettlebells to people in many different parts of the world now, especially in Asia. You know, so that's a great example of how the American fitness trends spread. And yet. You know, I live in San Diego and, you know, again, I'm, I'm sitting here. I don't even have a shirt on because San Diego is sunny every day. It's like probably southern Spain, right? <laughs> so, you know, but uh, most people around the, around the country, uh, you know, they're not, they're not in this healthy environment. Most people around, you know, what we would call middle America, they're eating a lot of meat and potatoes and McDonald's and drinking Coca-Cola and yeah. – um, are just as good and just as important as all of us, but they don't have the uh, the community and the knowledge and the support system to really be educated about something so important, which is you know nutrition. You you can't separate fitness from nutrition because it doesn't matter how many exercises you do if you're not providing high quality fuel, the car is going to break down. Exactly. And, and so it's, you know, like I said, it's both the leader and it's also uh, leading. It's kind of, it, it's kind of 
in the back when it comes to the average American being healthy. Fair enough. The, average, <laughs> the average citizen almost in every other country is probably healthier in terms of just being simple. It is paradoxical, simple living, you know. And so my rule of thumb is you count the McDonald's and the more McDonald's there are, the less healthy the people are going to be. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're, they're polar opposites. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a huge market, you know. It's, and yes, it's, uh, it is. That's why everything starts there. I mean, you are uh, the best in uh, Hollywood marketing, you know, everything, making everything, you know, nice, selling. Yeah, but, package. You know, health-wise. And, and that's not my interest, you know. I mean, I, I don't actually care about borders or nations. Like, I, yeah. I'm only Amer American because I was born here, but my ancestors came from Europe, and it doesn't really matter. People are people. Exactly. Uh, nations and borders are just imaginary things. So it's not – you know, the world is changing so rapidly and we can, we're not going to be able to, there's going to come a day very soon where we're not going to be able to talk about a country and say, oh, that country is this. We're going to understand that we all have access to the same things and we all have the same potential. Um, you know, but I, I, I'm not really big into the Hollywood and the packaging and the marketing and stuff like that because that's not real life. That's just illusion. You know, I'm about... I'm more old world, even though I live in the new world, you know, so um, it, I, I like to keep things simple and, um, you know, so yeah, it's interesting, but, but I, I'm, I'm always just concerned about the whole global. I don't think in terms of U S is a big market, but I mean, China's potentially even a much larger market and yes. Europe is a massive market. And so the, you know, the whole world is, is really a market and we're not limited by, uh, how far, you know, by, by the area that we can cover in a car or the area we can cover by walking any longer. And, you know, and, and with what I do, that's, that's a prime example. You know, we're here on the internet, you're in that's Europe. I'm here. <laughs> and so, you know, we're breaking down barriers. Exactly. I mean, everything is on the internet. So basically, you know, if you're online, you have the whole world in your disposal, you know, so you can reach so much people, you know, so many. So yeah, it's uh, it's a good thing. Uh, if you could change just one thing in the fitness industry, what would it be? Honesty. Honesty. Or lack thereof. Actually, <laughs> you're talking about the trainers. Well, we could talk about integrity. We could talk. I'm talking about again. You said industry, so that includes the trainers. It includes the the marketers. It includes the, the companies that are selling goods and services. Uh, kind of a companion with that will be the, the nutrient and the sports supplementation industry that kind of latches onto the fitness. And so even just backing up, I don't like to use the word industry at all. And I, I don't even refer to it uh, fitness industry. I, I call what I do fitness community because industry is a – it's an industrial. It's a – factory mm. you know industry refers to an assembly line or a factory line it's about widgets it's about product it's not about people and you know so whenever we start thinking in terms of industry we automatically make it a capitalistic thing where it becomes about profit and automatically things become corrupted if not immediately over time because the focus becomes on how many clients can I get and how much money, you know, wh what are we actually doing? You know, so yes, we're talking about the trainers, but we're talking about the education as well. Um, because it's not that trainers are bad. It's that they're raised in a community where they're not being taught to have ethics. They're not being taught to, to have integrity, which I can define sim simply as doing what you say you're going to do and being what you're talking about, you know, not talking all these promises and, and, you know, or talking about, you know, you're a fat loss expert while you're sitting there eating a Big Mac, drinking a Coke, you know, be consistent in what you do. And marketing's teaching the trainers to basically lie. Marketing saying, oh, promote yourself as an expert. Well, wait a second. That's not where I come from because where I come from in the traditional martial art, you don't talk about how good you are in martial arts. You're this, you're that. 
you show it because someone's going to come in and punch you in the nose. And all that talk and all those papers, it's not going to do you a bit of good. What's real is what you can do. And you only become an expert over time because people see you as an expert, not because you call yourself an expert. And but again, it's this it's this industry thing and it's putting everybody on the fast track. You're an 18 year old kid. You're going to go to school and be a personal trainer. You come out, you're an expert. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. OK, maybe in 10 years, if you commit yourself and you study and you practice and now you're an expert, you know, and you're still you still got your whole life ahead of you. So that's what I believe in. And, you know, like if people call me a master, it's because they see me that way. It's not because I call myself that. It's not for me to say, right, and put myself on a pedestal. And that's how I built my business, and that's what I believe in. So honestly, to, to answer your question, you know, in, in summary, I think there's a lot of problems with it. What I would change is I would change the level of integrity and the level of honesty and bring it back to just stay, you know, do what you're good at. Like we don't have to be experts at everything, you know, and – even if even if it's a young trainer that's just starting on, of course they need to make a living and of course they need to position themselves. That's normal. But it's not just about the physical skills. Like if you're a trainer, it's about people and it's about communication. So maybe you're you're inexperienced in terms of you don't have a lot of years under your belt teaching exercises. That's okay. But if you care, if you really care care, then you're offering a lot of value because that person is coming to you, that customer is coming to you because they need your help, they need your guidance. So you don't have them do a bunch of stuff that you don't understand. You just keep it simple to the things that you can teach and you can explain. And you spend time actually investing in that person and, and giving them attention because that's what people need. They need to be loved, they need to be cared for in one form or another. You know, versus, oh, I'm some muscle dude. I've been working out for 20 years. I got the biggest muscles in the gym, so I'm going to be your personal trainer. Well, maybe he doesn't care about you. Maybe he just cares about his biceps, so it's not going to help anybody, right? It's yeah. not about what I can do. It's about what I can do for you and how can I help you. So, you know, that's what I, you know, for me to have an educational program, that's going to be in the first – the first semester is going to be about ethics. It's not going to be about the latest trend, you know, because once you develop that standard of ethics, you can always add new things to that, and you study it. You become proficient. It's just like any profession. You take technical courses. If you're a computer programmer, a new program comes out, you learn the new system. You learn the Linux or you learn the Java or you learn whatever it is that's new. It's not like you have to go through the whole schooling again because you're already a professional. You just add. In, and I think that fitness can be the same way. you know. Um, but it starts with the person. Do you have a professional standard? Be good at what you're going to do. I, I never teach anything that I don't know. You know, and, and I have no problem saying I don't know if somebody asks me something that's outside instead of pretending to be an expert about everything, which is what the marketing is promoting. Um, that's that's it, it actually borders, in my opinion, borders on criminal because you're yeah. messing with people's health and it's ethical to say you don't know when you don't know. Oh, yeah, Viper, I'm an expert in that. Oh, yeah, T TRX, I'm an expert in that. Oh, yeah, BOSU, I'm an expert. Oh, yeah, kettlebells. Now, the kettlebells is good because then you separate the wheat from the from the chaff, as we say in English. You, you separate the, the posers from – you know right away if somebody – with kettlebell, it's too specialized. You can't fake it so easily. But, again, general public, general public doesn't know. They don't know what they're looking at. So you, the guy, the trainer can be holding his wrist like this in the clean. The the client's not going to know the difference. Exactly. And so they're they're promoting bad information. And that's that's what the problem is. It goes back to the ethics again. Um, but I, I work to change that in what I do. I work to, to set an example of 
you know, of uh, something different. And that's that's what I and I gravitate to people like yourself that also have a standard and have a, a self-respect that they're going to focus and be good at what they're going to be good at and what they like and actually be a professional and do the research and do the training and live by it, like do it. You know, people yeah. look at you, they look at me, they, they know we're fit, right? They, they don't question like, oh, maybe this guy, he doesn't look fit, but, you know, maybe he's smart. Well, you know, we're not brain surgeons, so I'm not going to – you're not coming to me because of exactly, – yeah. you actually are, but, you know, you're coming to me because I can help you with this part, right? That's why we're physical trainers and personal trainers and, and all that stuff. It's So you got to kind of stay in your lane, as I like to say. <laughs> walk, walk the talk. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Uh, so, uh, in the last, I don't know, couple of years, you've been very active in Asia. So, can you tell us a little bit about that market in Asia? How are people there? Oh, Again, it's remarkable. So- I, I love it, man. I, I really love it. I don't love it more than, than other parts of the world, but I love it just because I love wherever I am, and I'm there a lot. So, right now, I love it in Asia. But... um You know, China is a massive market in terms of people, uh, in terms of, I mean, I know that, you know, maybe uh, the diehard Europeans and, you know, Americans, they don't like to admit it, but China is the new superpower now. And, uh, you know, it's just, that's just the way it is. And uh, hopefully they do a good job with it. And, uh, you know, but again, the world's all interconnected, but, you know, Aside from all the politics of, you know, communist government and all this stuff, aside from that, you're just talking about people. They're, you know, they're good people. They're good people, just like like everyone's good people, and uh, they love it. They love training. There's more money in China now, so obviously the trends, you know, everything follows. Fitness becomes a trend, fashion, all those things. It follows the, the financial uh, because when people don't have money, they don't have time to work out. They don't have time to do other stuff. They don't have money to buy stuff. When people start getting a little bit of money, they want to take care of it. They want it to last, and they want to start taking care of their health. And that's how it works. And and so now that that trend is going to Asia. And, um, mainly, I'm in the sort of northern, mostly northern. Um, I'm, I'm most often in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, mm-hmm. and then uh, you know Singapore a little bit less, but, um, and I've been all throughout Asia, but I don't go to Philippines as much. I don't go to Indonesia as much just because, um, well, different reasons, but certainly on the, on the business side of it, um, it's, you know, it's very difficult to, uh, they can't afford. And it's not like I think I'm too good. I love everybody. And I don't actually do what I do for the money. That's a small part of it. I do it because I love it. And, You know, for me, it doesn't matter if there's one person or a thousand people. I'm still going to give my heart and soul to to everyone that gives me the honor of of learning from me, right? So, um, you know, but the economics of such is that's where everything is going on in Asia. It's kind of going on in China and Hong Kong and, and kind of Taiwan, the, the modern industrialized nations. And it's really crazy because, um, you know, China has, I don't know, probably it's got 50 cities with more than – three million people, you know, I mean, it's got at least 20 cities with, with not 1 million, 2 million, but you know, it's common. If you have 5 million in, in, a, in China, it's a kind of a mid-sized city because yeah. their big cities have 15 million, 20 million. And so it's crazy, Great. you know, and, and, and it's a big country, you know, so there's a lot of opportunity over there and I have great working relationships. I work with uh, Nike over there in terms of uh, they had Nike has now been moving into fitness. Uh, they've always been in apparel and they've been the king of apparel, but now they've decided they're going to start moving into the fitness world. So starting a couple of years ago, they, they start a, a fitness convention every year and I go over there and present uh, for Nike. And that's really good because uh, Nike is number one, you know, so um I, I'm not a sponsored by Nike. I just, we'd have a working relationship. And so that's, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of works out really well that way. And, um, what else? I mean, I like the food. So yeah, I bet. 
You know, I just got to find good quality food, but, um, you know, I, that's how I eat. I just eat vegetables and stuff anyway, so I don't, I don't eat meat or animal stuff. So, um, you know, it's the, the style of cooking, the traditional style of cooking is very appealing to me. Mm -hmm. You have some, some noodles with some, they don't, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard to find a, I mean, wheat is not really healthy and I don't normally at home eat too much wheat, you know? So like when my, when my Italian wife cooks me pasta, it's usually like, uh, brown rice pasta or chickpea pasta, you know, or lentil pasta, which is much healthier, especially if you're getting it from sprouted grains, right? But, exactly. um, you know, so on that side, the new Chinese noodles are usually wheat, so that's the negative, but but all the other stuff, you know, the food, I love the food and uh, um, love the people. Uh, the students are excellent students because the, the Chinese value education, Asians in general, they value education. They've, they're very upwardly striving in terms of it's important to the family. You know, they want their kids to be educated and then, you know, to develop a career. So what that means is for me, it makes good students because they're, they want to learn. They're not just caught up in the ego like, hey, I want, you know, I want to show everybody how – how alpha I am it's more like this is a career path and this is the teacher and they have a tradition of respecting their teachers so that's that's very nice from a teacher's point of view um you know so those are some of the things that but it's yeah it's it's a different world if a westerner isn't used to it and you know you go to some of these big cities like Shanghai it's really a really a different world everything is bigger Everything is just the people are smaller, but <laughs> but the cities are bigger and uh, crowded. Have you? But it's cool. You have a lot of expats. Have you learned some of the Chinese? It tian tian. It tian tian. Ni hao, ni hao ma, wo hao, xie xie, sai jian. Simple stuff. But they, they speak English, right? Most of them. No, no. no. They don't care, huh? Just Chinese? No, not really. <laughs> not really. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Yeah, there's Why so should many they bother with things? <laughs> <laughs> so, Everything, they got their own stuff over there. They don't yeah. have, they don't use Facebook. They use, you know, they have uh, uh, Weibo. They don't have YouTube. They have Yuko. They, you know, they don't have Instagram. Maybe. They have, uh, what is it? Maypai. And they have their own stuff. They have, their, they're not anglicized. Cool. Separate. But there are some people that do speak. Um, I have translators when I go over there in terms of for, for me. So that's how I deal with the language gap. Mostly you'll find some English speaking people in Shanghai because it's the most international city. You have a lot of expats from Europe and, uh, you know, New Zealand, Australia, U.S., U.K., Canada. Um, and in fitness you know, the fitness industry was actually started by the expats mm -hmm. that were living over there because obviously they had exposure to the trends that we get in North America and Europe, and then they bring it there. Um, so it's literally, fitness is literally brand new over there, you know. Um, you know, so you do have some people speaking English, but that that's basically, I need to learn Chinese is the way it's going to work, yeah. <laughs> not the other way around. They're yes. not going to need to learn English. And it's not really an easy language. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, but my approach is, you know, whatever few words I learn, learn to say them correctly first. So I pronounce, I may only know 10 or 15 words, but I pronounce them quick, uh, correctly. I can count. And I have a lot of experience as a teacher. So like, for example, um, even though I normally have translators, I was just there uh, last week, last weekend, and um, I was in a city in southern China named Dangguan, and uh, the night before I found out, my translator contacted me, and we, we use WeChat over there. WeChat would be like our, similar to Facebook, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, sent me a WeChat saying uh, there was no flights coming out of Shanghai. Shanghai. They canceled all the flights, so there was no way for the translator to get to the city. Eventually got there, but it wasn't until like three in the afternoon. The class started at nine in the morning, so <laughs> going to be without a translator, you know, but it was cool. Um, there was actually some, there was a student there that spoke a little English that helped and, you know, but I went into it thinking I'm going to still be able to teach them because you use your hands, you use your body and sometimes talking is, talking less is better.
Yeah. <laughs> Probably your listeners are thinking that. They're like, yeah. Talking <laughs> Yeah, I saw that on your Facebook page, and I was thinking, yeah, it must have been an experience. Yeah, it's cool. It's yeah. cool. All right. Um, you just talked a bit about it in, this, uh, in the beginning of this uh, last question. Nutrition. So I know you changed your views on nutrition in the last couple of years. So can you tell us a little about that? Uh, for me, well, I'll just back up a step. Uh, before I start talking about my own nutrition. Nutrition itself so, is about nutri nutrients. So another word for nutrients is fuel. And again, if I use the analogy of a, instead of a this, it's a car, yeah. the car runs on fuel. So you can put clean gas, you can put dirty glass. For sure, if you're a race car driver and you're in the Indianapolis 500 or Daytona 500, you're not going to put cheap gas. You don't even, you're not even in the game unless you're running on high octane fuel. So I see it the same way for me and what I do. I didn't used to know this. I didn't used to have this understanding. It was only in the last year that I completely changed everything. But, you know, so that's where we're coming from. Nutrition is nutrients. It's not about your beliefs or your habits or your ego, tradition, culture or what you like. It's not about, like, what is nourishing for me may or may not be what tastes good. I mean, sometimes it tastes good, but that's not why I eat. I don't eat for taste any longer. I eat because of nourishment. And yeah, given the option, I'm going to go for the taste of your food, but I have standards, and I'm not going to eat, you know, a piece of crap that's tasty, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, so that's how I see about nutrition. And then as far as myself, one year ago, I became strict vegan, which means I don't consume or participate with anything that involves animals. I don't kill to fuel. Um, oh, but you kill the plants. Okay, maybe someone's going to think that. But um, So I eat plants. I eat seeds. I eat nuts. Um Legumes, yeah, from the earth, from the earth, not not animals. I don't eat people. I don't eat dogs, cats, cows, pigs, chickens. All creatures are equal. That's how I see it. Um, that's how I see it. And as far as the results, it's been tremendous for me. Um, I feel much more energetic. Much uh, everything's better. My skin is better. My uh, temperament is better, more peaceful, more calm. It's not that I don't get excited sometimes, but my general state is uh, much more just healthy, energetic, enthusiastic, and peaceful. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of people that have ideas about uh, – there's a lot of people that have ideas about – Oh, you know, meat or non-meat. It's that's for each person to work out for themselves. You know, for me, I I live what I do. I back up what I do. I know a lot about it because everything that I am talking about is stuff that I do with myself and test on myself. So it's it's just my experience. I'm not going to sit there and have an argument with anyone saying, "Oh, not eat meat is better. Meat is better. You should eat meat. You shouldn't." I have my ideas. I know what's good for me. You ask my opinion, I'll tell you, but I'm not militant. I'm not going to try to convince people to change. I believe with education is illumination. So the more knowledge we have exposure to, the more understanding we have, and then we can make informed decisions. Um, but stepping away from the discussion of you know whether vegan or non-vegan, there's some common factors that everybody can benefit. Uh, we know that living foods – are healthier than dead foods, and that includes meat. You're better to eat raw meat if you're going to eat meat than cooked meat, for example, um, and, and every other food. I'm not saying 100% raw necessarily because certain foods you know, should be at least cooked somewhat, Roughly but um, um, the point is, is that uh, there's certain common factors, and – one of the factors is living foods. Uh, almost everybody will benefit by increasing their intake of, of uh, vegetables, for example. 
and eliminating toxins, eliminating poisons. So, you know, soda, I never drink it. Um, alcohol, I won't say never, but, you know, I can count on one hand the times in a year that I would have, you know, so alcohol is poisonous. Uh, you know, caffeine, I do have a little caffeine, but in general, um, you know, fake foods, I don't, I don't eat them. And, and with me, it's really easy because I don't have anything with butter or milk or, or animal fat or animal meat. So that pretty much eliminates all junk foods because all junk foods has at least one or more of those things, you know. So for me, my, my tastes have purified when I made that change. I don't have those cravings at all just because it's out of my system because a, a lot of the foods I used to eat, which would probably be like most people – uh, certainly in America is um, it's all animal fat. It's all you know milk and butter and cream, and so you get sugar and fat. These things are like drugs in how they behave, and our body actually becomes addicted to it. And so with, that's where the cravings come from, addictions. Um, animals probably don't have addiction. People that are eating very clean, they don't have these addictions or what I, or cravings, I should say. Um, you just know when you're hungry, but it's not like, oh, I need a cheeseburger or, oh, I need a piece of cake. <laughs> no. If I need sugar, I'm a, a fruit is like a dessert for me. Exactly. You know? And so, you know, from a bodybuilding point of view, they're going to think of it like, oh, discipline. He's so disciplined. Yes, it's discipline in a sense because discipline is just how you live your life. But it's not a chore. It's not like, oh, I really want to eat this stuff, but I can't because I – you know, I can't break. It's not how I see it. It's just the way that I gravitate, you know. So for me, it's very easy. It's very natural. Yeah, we are all unique. So definitely the most important things we should listen to our bodies, you know. At least. Yeah, and, and the best way is to experiment. And what I've found on that is if someone wants to know if eating a certain way is better, you know, because we get locked into our habits. And so you've been doing it a long way. The body changes. If you've been living off a of junk food and you introduce a very healthy food, even that healthy food could get you sick if you don't introduce it in the right dosage. So um, I think, you know, the, the correct way to go about it is if we want to discover, like you said, our own experience, we need to get clear signals to understand what those foods are telling us. Um, otherwise, we don't know. We feel different, but we don't really know why. And so the way to do that is you do a brief fasting doesn't have to be for days, but, you know, at least half a day or a day if you can. You, you clean the body out a bit, just drink water and, you know, some vegetable juice or tea or something. And you clean the body out. Then you introduce the, the new food, but you, inter you eat it by itself. You don't mix it because you need to see how does that food affect your body. And then you notice the results. The next day, how do you feel? How was your digestion? Did you have a lot of gas? Did you have bloating? Did you feel sluggish? How was your rest? How was your energy? And then you can really make correct and intelligent associations so you know this food has a positive effect on my body, this food has a negative, because you isolate it. And that's a scientific way of doing things as well. You isolate it so you know what's doing what. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fasting is such a powerful method. I mean, I've been doing it for so long and I think most of the people should at least try it, you know, because it's it's a, our body's natural system of uh, self-cleaning, you know. Basically, it's like giving your body maintenance, you know. Yes. So it's it's really, really working, with it. especially for people that are not eating healthy, you know. Fasting is very good because they, they give the time the body to clean out the junk. <laughs> very much, and, and it, yes. helps to, it helps to – there is a lot, a lot of, of uh, argument, argument and discussion, discussion on that. that. You have a lot of – people writing clickbait articles basically saying that um, detox diets and so is, is, is hogwash, you know, it's crap and it's harmful. And again, uh, nothing is in and of itself necessarily all good or all bad. It, everything is context and how it's applied. So if someone is eating crappy and then they decide to do a crash detox and then they go back to being crappy, of course that's not going to be positive. Of course it does more harm than good. However, done intelligently, there's absolutely a, 
uh, reality detox does occur in the body and fasting can provide that it, it, it's indisputable there's plenty of research and it has to do with cellular function and the cells become flushed when we provide a clean environment and an alkaline environment and you know um has nothing to do with our opinions about it you know this has been well established yeah it's, that's it i mean it's it's been in, in 1900s, I think there was a, a lot of uh, subject uh, done exactly for that, you know, and everything is written, everything, but, you know, the whole the whole industry, of course, you know, their goal is to make you sick and fat because that's how they make money, so. You come out of it, you know, a lot of people, they, they don't have the correct, they come out of it too fast or they come out of it very poorly, like they eat, you know, uh like a cheeseburger or something after fasting for seven days, so your body's going to go into toxic shock. Exactly. And then that becomes the article that everyone's talking about. It's just like somebody hurts their back with kettlebells because their trainer was irresponsible, didn't teach them, and then now the media says kettlebells are bad for you, they hurt your back. No, stupid trainers are bad for you and hurt your back. Kettlebells are, are neutral. They're not good or bad until you start using it. Exactly. So exactly. fasting's the same way. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge subject. We could <laughs> go on about it for a long time, but yeah, we have to keep it in a time schedule. Uh, tell us a little about, about uh, your future plans. Future plans, um, like future in five minutes or future in five years? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just teasing. Because uh, I'm all about the now myself, but yes. what, what I... What I um, the direction I'm moving in is I'm about really well-being and health. And again, fitness is a part of that. But, you know, I'm 46 years old and um, it's not old, but it's not as young as it used to be. And so the body undergoes changes. And for me, it's about just sharing with the world what I've found that works really well for me. It was just certain lifestyle habits um, has to do with the mind first and foremost, but certainly nutrition is a part of that. Certainly exercise is a part of that. Um, it's what I call the health happiness continuum, which I consider the highest level of existence because someone can be healthy, but not happy. Someone can be happy for a temporary state, but not sustainable because they're not healthy. Someone can certainly be fit without being healthy. That's why I say fitness. There's plenty of fit people going around with, you know, single digit body fat. They're not healthy at all because they're miserable or they're, you know, emotionally have imbalances or, or all these things. So for me, it's moving more out of the fitness, not completely, but not centered just around the fitness, moving more into the health, longevity, anti-aging. And when I talk about anti-aging, it's through natural methods, not the... You know, there's the whole industry on anti-aging using hormonal replacement and all this stuff where, okay, you're 35 years old, now you get a prescription for testosterone and all this ridiculous stuff, which is just another temporary Band-Aid. It doesn't address the underlying cause. So I'm about the underlying cause, which which really begins with our thoughts and how how that relates to the body and and hygiene practices, health practices, including exercise, nutrition, and, you know, breathing and meditation and these things. So that's the direction I'm moving in. Um, more mature audiences, you know, uh, in terms of not necessarily just fitness professionals or just athletes and coaches, but folks that really have an appreciation for life and have a lot of things good in life, but they're missing the health thing and they need to learn. And that's something that I've been practicing my whole life. So that's, that's, you know, I still going to stay with that. Um, and what forms, you know, definitely speaking, you know, speaking, writing, uh, that type of thing, just, just getting the information. So obviously over time, I'm going to be doing more over the internet, putting out more content that way, just because that's the, that's the best way we know how to reach across the borders right now is, you know, uh, the seminars still limit. I do a lot of seminars still, but again, I'm limited to the people in that region that, that can attend and even know that I'm there. You know, it's, it's yeah. too much based on the marketing aspect of informing people. 
versus uh, on the internet. Once it's out there, it's out there and anybody can access it. So um, yeah. I think I saw on your Facebook that you started uh, like some kettlebell university or something online. Yes, I've recently started. It's called Steve Cotter's Kettlebell University, which is an online academy, basically okay. taking someone from step one. They've never pecked up a kettlebell, never seen a kettlebell up to, OK, now I want to compete. At, in kettlebell sport and everything in between, you know, fat loss, uh, mobility. So yes, it, it's a uh, very extensive, uh, also includes a lot of mobility and flexibility segments, uh, and warm down and uh, warm up and cool down. And, um, yeah, that's a, that's a monthly, uh, subscription website. Okay. And it, yeah, it's very high quality. It's uh, very good, good information. And, um, all of your listeners are definitely would enjoy that. And actually, uh, thanks for bringing that up because uh, a person can do a one-month free trial. So if they go to just uh, www.kettlebell.university, they can just enter their email and they That's can uh, actually do a one-month free trial. So yeah, very good. Hundred percent, no risk there. <laughs> Yeah, that's very good. I mean, yeah, internet, uh, I mean, that's the only way to really, really spread. I mean, because, you know, with seminars, you're limited and and not just that. I mean, you're, you're getting wasted, you know, as you get older, you know, all this travel and everything takes toll, you know. It doesn't matter how much you love it, but still, you know, especially when you travel long distances, it just, it takes a toll. So definitely exactly. online is uh, now. It's not the future. It's now. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Very good. Okay. Uh, to wrap up message to everyone who is listening <laughs> first of all thank you for your time and uh, next love yourself starts with you yeah so people practice loving yourself accepting yourself not being angry um you know and that's how we make the world a better place is by making ourselves better and uh treat yourself the way you want people to treat you <laughs> excellent yeah very good thank you so much to you it was a, a pleasure and uh, i think the viewers are also going to enjoy it and uh, now we have to arrange for you to come to croatia i'm so excited it's uh, <laughs> one of the countries that i've always wanted to visit and i haven't visited yet so um, especially in some time i look forward to that being uh my one of my next places to visit the famous Croatian and the beautiful <laughs> lands that I've heard so much about. You're going to love it. It's amazing. It's really, it's really such a beautiful country, especially, you know, in summertime, the beaches and everything. It's amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I look forward to meeting the people. So. Yes. And I will be your translator in case somebody doesn't know English. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Our Croatians speak very good English. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them, but you know, you never know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Excellent. Cool. Very good. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your time and uh, we talk soon to arrange the details for uh, coming to Croatia. Sounds great, my friend. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Bye. See ya.